Okay. So yeah, our next speaker and last speaker of the day is Jacopo Denardis, and he's going to tell us about logarithmic anomalies of spin transport. Right. Okay. So hi everyone. It would be great to be uh, really in physically interested, but uh, to enjoy the seaside. But uh, the only sea you can enjoy is this uh, beautiful wave from Okusai. But okay, so I will continue mostly the what um, what Beer has been uh, telling uh, uh, about indeed anomalous transport in uh, one-dimensional chains, and indeed this is a. Uh, this is work in collaboration with many people, uh, and I will be in the discussion room. Uh, I think uh, we'll be the target for any questions. Uh, and um, so recently, we also work with uh, Roman and Sarang on uh, on something that indeed you would see in the slides. So uh, let me just quickly introduce the problem since uh, you've been hearing about this. Anyway, if you uh, there is a, a lot of ways to study non-equilibrium, but um, maybe the simplest way is to is to study linear response of systems. And uh, and, uh, and and if you want, like uh, one of the few uh, known laws of non-equilibrium dynamics is the fixed law. Just just tell you how a macroscopic system behave at large space and time given any sort. I mean, given it's, it's, it's universal, right? So. In the sense, any microscopic dynamic you expect, you expect to, to be given by something like this at large scales. And all microscopic interaction is hidden in this constant, which is the diffusion constant. And, um, and recently, not just in this field, but in many fields, there's been a, an effort to, to understand a bit more like how, for example, property of uh, chaotic dynamics are related to, to diffusion constant and so on. Um, so for uh, for me or uh, many people in the community, one motivation is really uh, can we understand uh, this law, which is non reversible, so just the emergence of non reversible dynamics from a microscopic reversible dynamics. So you just want to study a Hamiltonian system and see how at large scales you you see the emergence of a of a of a non reversible behavior, and uh, and it's not easy to find the exactly solvable system that actually give you normal diffusive dynamics. Um, for example, free system don't give you that. They just uh, show you usually ballistic transport. And, um, and of course, it's also interesting to know when it fails, uh, when uh, you have anomalous behavior. So it turned out in the past years that, uh, again, uh, quite a nice um, set of models that, the, that can answer a, a bit of all these questions are interacting integrable spin chains. Uh, not, only, not only they actually Despite integrability, they actually show uh, large-scale diffusion, um, and despite the reversibility, of course, uh, but they can also show uh, anomalous, uh, so uh, failure of the fixed law, and, uh, and that's why it's again a, a, another motivation to study this aspect of this model. So, um, what is diffusion constant? Uh, so, the, the simplest way to to define it, compute it, is by Kubo formula and. Uh, which tell you that basically DC conductivity, which is uh, uh, it's a matrix in case you have many constant quantities, if you have only one, uh, of course, it would be just a number, but it's a matrix, it's a matrix if you have many. It will be just uh, integrated, current, current correlated. So um, if you have a system which also has ballistic transport, you should subtract the ballistic part, which is called the root weight, which is basically the large time limit of the current, current correlator. So now this expression is always regular. It's always converged for any integrator. And this, it's a diffusion constant. So if it's zero, it basically tells you that uh, current current correlator is just through the weight. So there is no dissipation, current doesn't decay. And that's a free system, if you want. Um, but uh, as was shown a few years ago, uh, for an interactive system, uh, uh, for integrated integrable system, this is uh, it's positive. Uh, only few, only maybe one element is zero. For example, when the current is conserved, and um, but not only, there are also some charges. So now IJ level charges, like could be uh, energy, spin, uh, U1, all U1 charges, but also the higher charges. There are some charges, for example, the U1 charges, like the spin or the charge, that actually show uh, infinite DC conductivity. And this doesn't mean that it's ballistic because we are already subtracted. So it means that uh, this integral 
over time diverge, so the current decays lower than than you expect. <laughs> and uh, and basically, uh, then there are lots of numerical evidence, uh, although not perfect, because it's hard to simulate quantum system. For example, this is a uh, this is a TDMRG simulation of the Heisenberg chain. So you can take Heisenberg chain, chain spin one half, and the state of the art numerical simulations. So this is done in the group of Thomas Rosen uh, already a few years ago. Basically, if you take just the Heisenberg, so no anisotropy on, on z direction, you see that basically, and now you join uh, two uh, um, uh, two states that are basically infinite temperature states. So now, indeed, I uh, forgot to say, yes, we are interested in uh, transport of finite temperature. So is this the case of finite temperature? It's infinite temperature. No problem to define it on a chain. Um, so I joined two infinite temperature states with slightly unbalanced magnetization, and this is a way to study transport. It's really like what Kubo would tell you to do uh, to define this concept. And basically, you see that uh, spread in here is not uh, t to the one half; it's something t it's something larger. Instead, if you add uh, an isotropy on z direction, so now you're simulating x z, you see that the spreading goes as uh, t to the one half as diffusive. So now, in this case, you can say that there is a spin diffusion constant, and uh, and this is a fixed value, and you would like to know, and then indeed it can be computed nowadays. But here you can fit and uh, the exponent, and you see that doesn't uh, increase as t to one half, but increases to t to the one. Sorry, it doesn't go to constant, but increases t to the one third. So this was the starting of actually lots of numerical uh, simulation on this, and uh, indeed not only just the exponent was measured, but also what is the profile, the scale profile of magnetization inside here. And, um, also one can ask what is actually, what happened for a non-integrable chain? So because so far you've seen an integrable system, okay? So let me now study a non-integrable chain. For example, let me take uh, again Eisenberg chain, but for a spin one. So this is also called a lane chain if you want. And uh, or any generic spin s. So um, so one way again uh, to study the transport is, for example, looking at uh, spin spin relaxation rates. So just a uh, spin out of correlation, and you want to see uh, what's the exponent uh, that's the spin decay. Now, so this is uh, done by uh, Maxime Dupont and Joanne Moore uh, last year, and they did a simulation, and you see that for Eisenberg spin one half, you have a nice decay with the uh, exponent 3 over 2. So now 3 over 2 is basically the same. If you use the, uh, this, the fact that uh, autocorrelation decays at 1 over square root of t times diffusion constant, that, that tells you the diffusion constant diverges t to the one, one third. So they confirm this uh, exponent, which is basically KPC exponent. So then they did the same for spin 1. And even if it starts very closely to uh, exponent 3 over 2, well, they seek some kind of very slow uh, drift towards what would be the diffusive value, 2, which would just characterize just one over square root of t. So this is uh, hard to say. They concluded indeed that uh, indeed um, uh, for integrability super diffusion, this exponent, this anomaly exponent should be protective, while for integrability, non-integrability should uh, slowly drift towards uh, diffusive value. So uh, this was also done after that, um, me, together with uh, Nay, uh, Marco Medanyak, and uh, Christoph Karash, we studied uh, this system, and in particular, uh, uh, any, this, uh, this kind of chains in the low energy limit are described again by an integrable system, which is the nonlinear sigma model. And there, we could uh, prove uh, the versions of the conductivity. But of course, uh, the low energy theory does not describe the physical system. So you see that uh, in the physical system, there is something different to take. So what are the main statements, just to cut it short? So basically, um, these are statements that apply indeed, as Beer was saying, to uh, to apply to no matter what quantum or classical spin chains, because somehow we are looking at uh, properties of very large scales, and, um, and provided you are respecting some rules, you can always make quantum classical correspondence between the system. So in integrable chains, uh, either quantum classical, now there is quite uh, uh, analytical and numerical evidence that there is always coexistence of ballistic and diffusive spreading, although in some cases diffusive uh, is anomalous. And indeed, in rotation invariant integral chains, for example, any system with non-abelian non symmetry, like SU2 or SU3, uh, or maybe SUN, uh, this remains to be checked. Um, the local magnetization uh, can be phenomenologically described at large scale by a Berger 
or KPZ field, then basically it's a field whose uh, current is a nonlinear, nonlinear, and there is a, an exponent parameterizing this nonlinearity, and it depends on the Hamiltonian. But for Heisenberg, it's two, and it's KPZ plus. So what happened in rotation, in rotation invariant non-integrable chains? Well, then uh, basically we cook up some uh, phenomenological model that uh, seem to describe what numerics ob observe set and also a bit confirm what Beer was saying that basically um, what you should expect that there is still a burger field that describe your um, local amortization, but the environment or the noisy environment where it moves basically change with time and the late time decays. So it doesn't kick you the system and the system basically cross over to diffusion, but with uh, logarithmic time. And I will try to tell you a bit more. Uh, so basically, just a very crash course on why there is a diffusion in integrable system. So this morning, well, this morning, <laughs> a few hours ago, you heard that Takato uh, telling you about uh, GHD and also Axel, of course. And, uh, and as Axel was indeed remarking you, is that uh, the existence of GHD is basically due to the fact that in integrable system, at any energy scale, not just in the low energy limit, you can always have uh, stable uh, excitations on top of a uh, background state. And the simplest excitation are one particle excitation, where basically you take one of this particle, you kick it. And this is basically simulate the fact that the system is, there is like a particle moving through a background, like a final temperature state, at some point kick with the system and gets slightly deviated. And the deviation in proportion to the scattering shift. And this is what dress the velocity. So now there is a ballistic motion with some dressed renormalized velocity, but it's still ballistic because particles don't decay. They just get renormalized. Then, but particles can also actually have two body scattering. And whenever they meet, they have two body scattering and this redistributes their momentum. I mean, redistribute either the permute or they remain the same. Of course, we are in 1D. But this leads to diffusion. And diffusion, indeed, this phenomena is described not by T itself, but the uh, fact that uh, you're in a constant, in a final background. And, you're, and therefore, it's parameterized by a, a dressed version of the scattering shift. Nevertheless, these two body scattering all take into account all diffusive term. And this was our result with uh, Benjamin Doyon and, uh, <coughs> and Denny Bernard. And, uh, and basically, this uh, it's the microscopic mechanism for diffusion. Of course, this is very quick. Uh, it can be said in many more words. But um, So now, OK, we were very happy in, in 2018 uh, to have the, finally an expression for the diffusion constant in the integral system, something that actually was uh, was looked for many years. Uh, and in the 80s and 90s, there were many different attempts. Um, and so we applied it finally to uh, the most beloved system, the capability, and it did the spin one alpha XHG chain, where indeed there were already numerics available from, uh, from Tomas and so on. And basically, um, we could write the spin diffusion constant as a sum of contribution. And this you can read them as some uh, bound state contribution. And it, eventually, some all complicated computation that you can do to compute this diffusion constant either using this kind of uh, uh, form factors, uh, because this eventually reduced to summing of some form factors, or using what uh, Roman and Sarang did, using more like kinetic approach. Basically give the same answer, which is a very simple answer. Basically tell you what uh, you can read in, um, in textbook, that diffusion is given by some effective velocity times some, uh, if you want, uh, mean free path. And, uh, but you have to sum over all the, all the basically modes that you have in your system. These modes are like bound states. And you can read them as bound states on manions if you want, because uh, your, system, your elementary excitation, even to construct final temperature state, you can use uh, these uh, manions. Uh, of course, now I picture them like this, but they are not like this. This is only in the limit where basically if I would have a strong anisotropy in Z direction. But let me just picture like this. You can really picture them as some uh, uh, extensive bound states where their their size is exponentially in S, and uh, as this number S increases, basically this bound state becomes, becomes larger and larger. And because of integrability, they are all stable. Okay, and uh, and the fact that basically uh, the, if you are in this model and the Eisenberg model, well, it, it's something critical happened. That basically this uh, mean is the this mean free path, if you want to see, is proportional to S. And this you can read it because uh, basically you are finite density. There is no mean free path. The only moment where these bound states uh, move freely is when they meet each other. Because when they meet each other, they jump. 
is they jump by size s. So if you want to, the mean free path is fixed. It's just given by the dimension of the of the of the bound states. But that velocity as a function of s decay as one over s. And uh, you see that basically you're summing something that becomes constant, which basically delivers. And uh, this basically is a way to extract the um, also the scaling exponent as Roman Serang did, as you get t to the one third. And uh, recently, <coughs> with uh, indeed with the Nair Roman Sarang, we uh, basically showed that uh, if you look at the dynamic properties of these bound states at large s, and you take this uh, large s limit in some proper way, basically you have to introduce a cutoff, which is the magnetic field, and rescale this magnetic field to zero, well, something magical happened. Basically, you go from a quantum model with bound states and so on to a classical model, which is basically landau uh equation. And uh, you see it because this is also an integrable model and it has solitons, classical soliton solutions. And these solitons have a scattering shift. And this is indeed this one with the log. Basically, you can take this limit and get this, you get the solid. So basically, what we understood is that, uh, or basically confirm what uh, somehow there was an expectation that these uh, large scale bound states are nothing else than just soliton solution of a classical uh, PDE. And therefore, this confirmed the fact that. Uh, um, KPZ in quantum chain and classical chain has the same nature. There are some wide soliton solutions that move through the system and have zero energy, and therefore you can produce them as much as you want. And basically, this uh, leads to anomalous transport. And uh, okay, so let me just go a bit quicker here because basically we use this intuition to compute uh the um, basically this lambda kpc so what is lambda kpc basically if you have a burger equation then you would expect there is a parameter uh for the nonlinearity. this parameter basically give you the large time dynamics of uh, because uh K, basically the kpc theory tell you that the spin spin correlation on large scale should uh, be described by the universal scaling function which is not gaussian this kpc function and there should be a, a non-universal parameter which is called lambda kpz that can now can be extracted with uh, and it's a parameter of this emergent gas or so or classical solitons basically you have to run some uh, complicated tba to to Thermodynamic better answer to get it. It's actually an interesting TBA because it's uh, now it's continuous. It's not any more discrete, of course, because classical physics is continuous. Um, but anyway, then you can compare with the MRG solutions. And what's interesting is that uh, this parameter is non universal. It depends on the model, but also depends on the temperature. So basically, if you compute uh, spin spin relaxation rates at different temperature, you will see a different emergent uh, KPZ parameter, and so, which we try to fit with. Um, the MRG, uh, for example, this is spin spin correlation multiplied by t to the two third, right? So it goes to a constant. And this constant is can be given, it's given basically that by this parameter. And this is the value, it's quite good. Uh, relaxation to the to this uh, parameter, it's low. Uh, it seems to go as t to minus one third. And this is uh, some also what is expected in uh, KPZ universality classes for um, for different systems. But anyway, so this is very good, but still it means uh, some kind of uh, interpretation of, of why there is KPZ. So at least we understood that uh, we don't have to look at quantum mechanics, which is hard, uh, but we can look at classical. And now, uh, indeed, as Vir was telling you before, basically uh, you can uh, just, given a, a classical Hamiltonian or a quantum, just take the, the, semi, the semi-classical mean field limit and uh, read it as a PDE. And once you have a PDE, there is this nice uh, uh, gauge invariant uh, reference frame, which is called Frenesere, indeed, where basically you don't uh, anymore look at the evolution of the spin, but you look at the evolution of two parameters, basically energy density and what's called torsion. And the energy density can be neglected in a, in a Tronanami limit, and, and now you basically have an emergent equation that describes your spin at large scale only in terms of the torsion of the spin. And... Um, so basically, uh, you can reduce all the problem. If you just to know what kind of transport you will have, it seems that it's good enough to uh, just given an Hamiltonian, which you write as some continuous spin field theory, just extract what is the leading term in the nonlinearity of the of this PD written in terms of torsion. But then, of course, uh, you ask yourself, but okay, but I can do this for an integrable Hamiltonian, but also for a non-integrable one. And given some symmetry property, for example, SU2 or 
uh, I will get the same equation. So integrability doesn't play a role. Whenever I have a rotational invariance, I will have the same equation. Well, no, because it seems that the integrability comes into um, basically the noise that you add to this equation. Why do you add the noise? You add the noise because you're still uh, tracing away a lot of other degrees of freedom. You're doing a hydrodynamics. So you're doing hydrodynamics and on noise act as a, the effect of the other degrees of freedom that act that basically scatter with your spin. And uh, if you have integrability, basically you'll have ballistic modes that still travel into your system and basically keeps it in your doing all the time. But if you have non-integrable, you expect that all the other modes decay and actually decay diffusively. So basically you can do these ansatz for the strength of the noise that you put in your, uh, in your torsion equation. And then you say, okay, but what do I do with, um, with uh, uh, some kind of a KPZ equation with noise dependent? And actually we were lucky because last year, I mean, a few months ago, indeed uh, uh, the group of Pierre Dussal and other people, they actually started this kind of uh, uh, nonlinear equation with the time dependent noise. And they claim that uh, if noise is stable, the large time dynamics is indeed KPZ, but if noise decays diffusively, then you're actually in a critical point and you basically uh, go to a diffusive class, but with logarithmic corrections. <clears throat> but basically the claim is that even in an integrable chain, so if you're integrable and uh, this n is equal to, you indeed display KPZ scaling. But if you are non-integrable, you display uh, diffusion scaling, indeed, so your exponent is diffusive, but you have uh, logarithmic corrections. And this logarithmic correction actually is what basically uh, delay infinitely uh, the emergence of diffusion in your system. So we tested, and I, I need to finish, but uh, uh, we tested this and uh, basically on the classical chain, which is basically the Eisenberg classical spin chain, um, and uh, this is classical now, so it's non-integrable. It's non-integrable still as SU2 invariant. So we didn't, it's not, it's classical, so it's great because we could do simulation up to, uh, uh, up to several decades. And indeed we plotted a diffusion constant function time and we see nicely that uh, it increased with some logarithm scales. While if you instead study another classical system that uh, has a different uh, uh, non-linearity power, for example, this chain or this, this is nonality power three and this is nonality power four, you still see that uh, diffusion constant goes to, to, uh, to final value. So this was uh, quite surprising because uh, one usually expect that uh, non-integrable chain uh, displays always final diffusion. And actually this is a largely studied model. You can go back to the literature in the eighties uh, people were studying this chain numerically and they always find a contradicting uh, results. Somebody was claiming it was super diffusive, somebody was claiming diffusive. Uh, eventually, at least this seems to say that yes, there is, uh, uh, it's diffusive but with some logarithmic and it seems all related to this emergent uh, KPZ um, dynamics. So uh, I wanted to show you other checks of this uh, prediction, but okay, I overestimated the time. Uh, let me just go to the conclusion. So basically, anomalous KPZ transport in azotropic quantum chain is related, at least now we can see it from uh, thermodynamic methods, uh, to, the to this emergent soliton gas. And as Spear said, it can be also related to cold, some kind of Goldstone mode, so although the correspondence is still could be done even more, kind, more better. Um, different type of transport can be all reduced to uh, a nonlinearity exponent and the presence of absence of ballistic modes. And this basically now will give you a table to characterize uh, transport in uh, isotropic models. Is, if there is something else we don't know, we conjecture that this is uh, all you can observe, but of course uh, the jury is out. Uh, open questions. Well, KPZ emergence still needs to be proven from fifth principle. This is a very nice problem that uh, uh, invite people to do. But okay, maybe the more interesting problem is uh, can we prove the fact that non-integrable isotropic chain have infinite diffusion? That would be great. And with this end up, sorry for uh, overshooting. Thanks a lot, Jacopo, for this very nice talk. Uh, so we have we have some time for questions. I kill everyone. Uh, okay, Jacobo, can I ask a question? Hi. Hi. 
Uh, yes, so basically you were talking about, uh, I mean, this uh, classical limit of, uh, uh, of Hasbrook chain. Uh, we all know that it's kind of landau Lifshitz. And the, the point is, when you try to quantize landau Lifshitz, actually you can do that. And you could, you could get some quantum states that are kind of corresponding to the classical soliton, if you want, or finite gap mm -hmm. integration, if you want. Uh, yeah, but then there actually string hypothesis doesn't apply. I mean, you can really see that uh, at thermodynamic limit, uh, this density of uh, the better rules, they don't satisfy string hypothesis. But uh, if you want to take the limit of TBA, so TBA assume string hypothesis, why these two can somehow yeah. be the same? Yeah, it's a problem of limits, right? Uh, here we are first taking a thermodynamic limit and then taking uh, this large uh, wavelength limit. And you are you could do instead, uh, in, and it seems to you that you're doing first large wavelength and then thermodynamic limit. So this is indeed something that uh, discussing with Nay. It should be possible. To, I mean, uh, this gas of classical soliton could be either constructed by indeed taking uh, a TBA and now taking this large uh, wavelength limit, but also could be constructed by taking uh, these modes that you have in classical theory and taking and find a number of them. Uh, so far, we only know how to do the first one. We don't know how to do the second one. Uh, but eventually, indeed, there should be a, there should be a way to to do it in both ways. But so far, uh, could only see this. Yeah. So I'm a bit, let's say, surprised at how well TBA already worked. Since I mean, you, people assume string hypothesis there, so it's kind of. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, <laughs> String hypothesis works, right? I mean, uh, uh, at least to get, uh, I mean, it, it works in so many other contexts, but um, I agree. There is, uh, yeah. it's it's very interesting limit. And, uh, and indeed, we, uh, this was just uh, the first one, the first time where we noticed this. Um, right. And, and also um, kind of, the, there's another difficulty, as you said, when you're taking the other way, the limit the other way around, is that how to uh, kind of compare the classical and quantum thermodynamics, because I think it's, it's still not, it's a very subtle thing to take uh, thermodynamically different systems. It's kind of, yeah. because solitons are kind of fermionic or? Yeah, indeed. Uh, so there, indeed. Uh, now what we see, what we find is that uh, the, the, for example, the, um, this, the, these are, of course, this, the quasi-particle and TBA are fermions, but as you take this limit, uh, it, they become classical. So the occupation number actually are not anymore between zero and one. Um, but indeed, I mean, it, it, there is a lot to, to know, and you know a lot because you've been working on this, and uh, so it was great to discuss. Yeah, I guess not, yeah, okay, thank you. Can, uh, I can go maybe a bit slower in, in the session. To, to yeah, yeah, indeed. Sorry, I had to get very fast. It's quite subtle, yeah. Um, any other question? Okay, can I ask a question, actually? Yeah. So, just uh, just to clarify, so the so the noise term somehow uh, put my video uh, goes down in non-integrable models because you don't have all these uh, kind of stable modes that provide a bath that provide that gives noise. So, but of course, in any model, integrable or not, there is noise. So what you're saying is actually there's that noise is another scale. And then you look at the noise produced yeah. by this very large scale stuff, yeah. which then affects this even larger scale kind of uh, spin waves. That's, that's yeah. uh, how you divide things? Yeah, exactly. This is the correct way to say it. Because indeed, again, uh, this is a phenomenological theory that only tells you that you're going faster than diffusive or not. If you're yeah. not going faster, it tells you nothing because uh, you're not you're not putting a lot of stuff that uh, this doesn't predict any diffusion cost. But if you're going faster, then it tells you who who indeed uh, uh, can reach you, right? <laughs> and indeed, this is a noise that is expected to be on scales that uh, that uh, act uh, on. Uh, and so similarly, faster. of course, in nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, is the is the ballistic mode that provides. The information yes, about so this is uh, was a bit why we maybe boldly conjecture that uh, this is not integrability on I mean the, the distinction is it's not just between integrable and integrable yeah. if you would have uh, one extra ballistic mode uh, it should work yes. um, and indeed in linear fluctuating dynamics you always have uh, one ballistic mode that's why yeah mm -hmm. so that's what um, we thought that the reason why in linear fluctuating dynamics you always see KPZ is because you always have a uh, 
at least one ballistic mode. But maybe now uh, Herbert can contradict me. On. Okay. Um, we have one very quick question. Anyone else? Uh, hi, Jacobo. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, so with regards to um, how quickly you saw uh, Lambda KPZ converge in time, um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you can um, also sort of use your you know, theory of the KPZ equation with noise to sort of get like a finite time convergence of the full profile to the KPZ profile function. Uh -huh. um, in yeah, order to right. sort of use the DMRG data to sort of more to distinguish whether the DMRG data is really showing KPZ or non KPZ. And yeah, finite time. one should use uh, one should solve a burger equation at finite time and maybe using the, the, the one loop theory that uh, Herbert introduced. It's, uh, I don't know if this can give you finite time results for the, but indeed, because you see, whenever, the problem is whenever you write this, you write an infinite time prediction indeed. And, um, and indeed, one has to find some finite time. Uh, it's probably indeed, uh, of course, the full evolution is model dependent. It's a mess, but uh, there are uh, there are ways to I guess, at least get details. And this actually was done, uh, as far as I know, in uh, in uh, not in these models, but in uh, stochastic classical system. There are ways to get uh, details of this. Uh, so indeed, good point. This should be done. Great. Thanks. All right. So um, if people are interested in talking about super diffusion some more uh, they can join the Jitsi room um, and so I suggest we unmute and uh, thank and uh, you know, thank you Jacopo yeah. um, so, all right so we have a break room again uh, so for the speakers Jacopo and Via once you're done with your breakout rooms if students don't have questions anymore you can also join the Jitsi room if you want uh, Sounds and good. with this, uh, all right, I will see everybody back on Wednesday. Yes. Bye bye. On uh, on which uh, on which topic? Like uh, I didn't get uh, the, the like the final claim. 
sorry, the what? Right, this. Um... Yeah, so, uh, in, yeah. Um, so. Okay, so first it should be said that uh, this is a mostly phenomenological uh, way to to describe uh, how things go. But it's wearing a mask. That's really the Dutch are too intelligent for masks. Uh. <laughs> Well, they don't wear yeah. either, so. I'm not sure. Ah, instead of the mask, wow. <laughs> 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 